Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our third. Is this our third or second? Third, I believe. Third council meeting for this uh, calendar year, for the school year. Um, I hope everyone had a lovely Thanksgiving, and I hope everyone had a very nice Thanksgiving and everyone survived it without um, too many issues given these variants and different strands of this virus, it just seems to never be going away. Um, so I hope everyone's families are healthy and you're healthy and it's good to see you all. Um, I'm going to just get right started into the meeting so that um, I don't have any interruptions as I mentioned earlier. Uh, starting with the minutes from the October 1st, 2021 meeting that was sent around, I believe, Monday of this week. So you, you've had an opportunity to review it. And I have um, a motion to approve the minutes from the council member. Motion. Second. Uh, who moved? Uh, Melissa, I thought that was. M Melissa was the second. I thought I was, okay. That's okay. Okay, okay, okay. Melissa Archibald moved and Bill Hohauser seconded. Um, any changes, amendments? Okay, hearing none. The minutes from the October 2021 council meeting are approved. And let's move on to the report from President Sams. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. I will echo um, our chair's sentiment that everyone had a good kind of brief holiday um, and actually are gearing up for a good closing to yet another challenging year. So there are two pieces to my report today. The first is going to be kind of the typical report that I'm going to try to be done with in about seven minutes. And then we're going to have a larger presentation from one of our esteemed faculty members. And I'll tee that up in a moment. By way of providing a kind of formal report, I wanna start by just touching on a number of items just related to the closure of fall semester, considering this will be our last meeting for this academic semester. Uh, we have been very fortunate and effective in managing COVID on our campus with a rate being under a half percent of uh, one, half of 1%. We've had about 50 cases on a, uh, in our community is well over 5,000. And so we've, but we've done really, really well. I think what's notable is that we've done really well within our student population to include residential population. If you recall, we went to a universal single uh, policy, if you will, or practice, probably practice, uh, with the understanding that in doing so, there's some natural isolation that occurs and it enabled students to stay kind of isolated for those who wanted to, to be even more mindful than the average person. And I think it's fair to say in terms of the numbers that have come out of our residential platform that we've done fairly well on the residential front. And so we're really happy about that, but I think it is also important to underscore the roles that students played in it. Just themselves, being mindful, adhering to the expectations all the way from vaccination, to testing, to wearing of masks and maintaining distance. And even in the way in which they engage in smaller scale activities, our students have been mindful and have done a great job. And I, I, I don't want us to lose sight of that. While at the same time in this last semester, we've seen a dramatic increase in activity across the campus in and among our students. So we believe that we've been able to strike a balance between increasing the level in which students are engaging with one another, trying to have you know, students uh, connect, albeit not too closely, while at the same time being mindful of kind of the COVID prevention uh, behaviors. They've done a great job and likewise so too have our faculty and our staff across the campus. There's no way in the world we can have one half of 1% in terms of COVID cases without it being an all in approach. And we enjoy that kind of low 
incidence rate because folks have been mindful and on one another in terms of uh, managing their behavior. So I just wanted to recognize that. The next thing I wanna talk about is just to draw your attention to the performance planning process. Just as a quick reminder, performance planning is our opportunity to annually offer up across the college uh, RFPs or proposals in response to what we laid out as five priorities for the year, those priorities being to strengthen the college infrastructure, improve institutional capacity, innovate transformative programs, advance educational models, and finally to advance a culture of excellence. And what we've done across the campus is to not only present those priorities, but to invite the campus to offer uh, proposals. We have garnered 42 proposals, which is really exciting when you think about as a first year, the fact that we have 42 proposals representing collaboration across the campus, collaboration across departments, across units, um, involving students and involving external partners. Uh, 42 proposals that now go to our budget and planning committee who will do some vetting of those proposals with the ultimate goal to figure out which proposals we are able to support for the next fiscal year. The, the, the model is we propose the initiatives in year one and it is in year two where we get lift off or engagement of those proposals. But it is exciting to think that we have 42 proposals. Um, and so more to come. I will continuously update you as we continue to move through the advancement of these proposals from great ideas to engaged or enacted ideas. Just by way of update, last conversation or last time we met, we talked about the matching grant. And I just want to give you an update. And that update is real simple. We haven't heard anything. <laughs> We're still waiting for SUNY to announce uh, who the recipient, recipients are of these matching grant requests. We sent in three, as you recall. The first was for Daycare Center Student Social Services Center asking uh, the, a, a project that costs about $3 million. Uh, the second is for Rathskeller School of Business Applied Entrepreneurship uh, proposal, and that too is $3 million, and then a $10 million proposal to create our social and environmental justice center. We're still waiting to hear, as are many other SUNY schools. Don't know when we will hear, but our fingers are still crossed. We are still in every angle that we can possibly push uh, that our proposals get uh, approved and funded. We're doing that. Many of you were part of, have been part of the search for our next vice president for institutional advancement. Um, we've had the finalists on campus that concluded last week. I think it's fair to say that we had a good uh, collection of finalists. I have heard from many and almost all who have been part of the interviews in the form of surveys, in the form of meeting with formal groups. I got a couple of phone calls to make and so that I can be certain that I've spoken to everyone who has touched this search process and gotten their input. And early next week, I will be rounding the bin and, and formally uh, engaging in conversation toward uh, making a hire. Uh, can I just jump in for a second, yes, Tim. Please. I'm sorry to mm -hmm. interrupt for the council members that were uh, a part of that interview process. First, thank you for taking the time. I know mm -hmm. it was usually in the middle of a work day, but I did um, let those council members that did participate know that there would be a call coming from President Sams, so that that's still coming. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. to let you know. Yep, yep. So that, that is coming and very shortly, uh, I'll be able to share who our next Vice President for Institutional Advancement will be. I think it's all fair to say, not only did we have a great slate of candidates, but the process underscored how much work whomever <laughs> gets this appointment will have before them. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done and 
I'm excited about the fact that we got some applicants who are excited about that work. So the final thing I want to raise is just to give you an update on a couple of capital projects, the first being the campus athletic field restorations. If you've been on campus lately, especially you council members, you will see that the tents are gone, the stone, apparently, you know, eight feet of gravel have been removed and you see a nice flat track of dirt. There's no electrical and plumbing put in yet. We are busily working with the construction fund, FEMA and other powers that be to see if we can make some adjustments. Adjustments primarily around moving from grass to synthetic or turf or used to, uh, commonly called, as well as making adjustments to the orientation of the fields. Those are the two major adjustments and kind of the baseline, some additional adjustments would be most especially bringing us up to cold by um, adding some facilities that, that uh, respond to the fact that we have both men and women using these facilities, as well as a couple of other items. We are working with, when I say we, as Martha and her shop are in constant communication with the construction fund to try to get these fields turned around. Uh, I'll give you a, a, an example of the problem with the fields. The fact that the fields are in or misplaced, most especially the baseball and softball, field, ball, softball fields, mean that we are unable to go into postseason play. That coupled with not having turf when the rest of the Skyline Conference has turf means that no one wants to play postseason on activities on our um, fields. So even if our baseball or our softball team earns postseason play and home play, Skyline Conference discourages us from using our field because the other fields are turf. We can't have that. Our, our players deserve to play uh, and to have that home field advantage. So we're working and I will provide you with an update as soon as we get one finally. And actually what we are here to talk about in the next phase of our conversation, and that is the natural science building. You will find that we have been working well over a decade to try to get an upgrade to our natural science building. Um, and I actually won't go into that discussion because we have a, one of our magnificent biology professors. Dr. Kenning Poon, who is going to present for us next and engage us in a conversation around the science um, building renovation. Originally, we had looked for both a renovation and an expansion. Today, we're going to talk specifically about a renovation, but we ask that you do not lose sight of the fact that we also need an expanded science platform. And I think Professor Poon is going to highlight that need in her presentation. So if you wanna know more about Dr. Poon, you can, if you go to our biology website, she will be the first face that you will see on our bio page and it's well-deserved as you will see from this presentation. So without- and before, further, Tim, before we yeah. go to biology, uh -huh. can um, we just go back to turf? Um, mm -hmm. So the, the cost of um, that project is, is sitting where? Not to be done, to be grant funded, to raise yes. money? What's the-, what's the Great question, part? Teresa. So, so the conversion of our fields to a hospital is a FEMA project, right? And we all know it costs well over $100 million, right? It's all in the newspaper. Um, the process of converting it back to a, the field are, is it 12 or 14 million, Martha? It's 9, nine, million, million, to, nine, it's nine million to nine million to put it back exactly <coughs> with, as it was before with the defects. Right. So, so what she's saying there, Teresa, FEMA has a policy and it's, as, as you know, it's, it's federal law that they are only allowed to take it to the way they found it as a facility. They cannot make upgrades. So as they found it, it had these kind of defects that I'm talking about. The, the fields are misplaced um, and there's no turf if we stick there. We also have some Title IX compliance issues. 
that I spoke of or alluded uh, to a second ago. But those were the defects that they found when they got the land. They can only take it back. What we are asking for is that they provide us the funds to take it back and that the construction fund at SUNY add to those funds to upgrade it so that we can put synthetic turf and to reorient the fields and the corresponding lighting, et cetera, et cetera. So who are you asking permission to do that? Who is leading that request? The construction fund. The construction no, fund who, has to who, go to OGS. So FEMA has now turned the project over to OGS. Tim, I think she's asking who from here is. is no, what I'm asking, what I'm asking for. So let me ask you this way: mm -hmm. Would would if FEMA has um, has FEMA agreed that yes, we're gonna we're gonna um, allow that to happen with the construction funds, or if FEMA has not agreed? FEMA has given us the funds that they would use to take it back to okay. where they found it. When I say us, they've given it to OGS. Okay. And now the negotiation exists between OGS and UCF, uh, the construction fund. Did I get that correct, Martha? Yeah. And so now it's a dialogue between OGS, the construction fund, and us. And, and construction fund, just to be clear, is Albany. That, that's yes, Albany. Both of them are Albany, actually. So if you had $3 million, this wouldn't be an issue because you could do the 9 million plus the three. You have we, the issue. We need you... more than that. We need another 8 million, is it, Martha? Or? I'm confirming, one second. I believe it's 14, it's, yeah, it's, it's 14.6 for, for a total of 24.2. Million, yeah. Million. Go ahead, Mike. Teresa, to your point, uh, yes, if we could find the money from elsewhere, it would make life easier. The only challenge that comes in then is the bureaucracy starts to get in the way about, especially right now with two agencies involved, That's right. about where that money ends up, whomever is giving you that money, what they have to agree to in terms of liability and some things like that. It gets, it, it gets, it can be done. That's how Stony Brook built the Long Center, right? Um, it just has some other weird little caveats that come into play. And, and do you think that at any measure that, um, like from a federal sort of perspective, um, like a, does, would Chuck Schumer know, have an understanding of, hey, this is what the university used the fields for? This is what happened, and this is where. Did, has anybody told the story to the senators? Only because there's a fair amount now of round two of infrastructure and pots of money, and and the school is in North Hempstead or Hempstead? What town? Oyster Bay. Which which town are we in? We we partly sit in the town of Oyster Bay, and the remainder of it is in the town of Hempstead. So both you have two two townships, um, I, I just say at, at, at some level for this size of a project, I think you have to get the Senator, especially Schumer, understanding of how the university's land was used, what you're trying to do and seek his advice on working with the towns in the money that they have coming under infrastructure of how to help. Okay. You know, I just, I think that he would be the best positioned to um, sort of start a, start a path for the college. Okay. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Thanks for that. All right. Appreciate that. Any other questions? And Fernando, it was grass, what we want is synthetic turf now. Does that address what you were raising? Yeah, yeah, but I guess the I guess the point on, on the the point is that the the fields were playable, right? Um, at the standards of um, the Skyline Conference before, and right now, right now they're not. So they yeah, right. they say that they they that FEMA restores to the original state. That you know, I'm trying to understand what does that mean. That Basically means that it would I... go back to what you recall or what you're referring to as natural grass versus turf 
All the other skyline fields are turf. Yeah. I think there's another piece, you know, not to go too much into it, just for your edification. We're only talking about our athletic team contest. Remember, when you have grass, the teams in and of themselves tend to tear up the grass. After that happens in terms of team play, team practices, rarely are students able to avail themselves because they have to preserve the grass for games, right? When you have turf, intramurals, random serendipitous athletic uh, and just fun can happen from a student perspective. And that's part of the move to turf as well because it gives you greater wear, a lot more student activity on those fields. And it is environmentally, it's thought to be a little bit more environmentally responsible in this sense that you don't keep, you don't have to water them. Just, okay, I'd like to move to Dr. Poon. Are you ready? Again, she's gonna give us a presentation on the natural science building. And at the conclusion, I've already sent some information to Millie, you shared it with the council, correct, Millie? Um, I'm, I'll chat with you later about that. Okay. Um, Send some information. Well, anyway, um, at the conclusion of this, the advice we're going to ask for from the council is in the spirit of that which Teresa just provided to give us some, some of your best thinking in terms of how to really advance what we're looking for. And, and again, Dr. Poon will highlight that, uh, how to move forward so that we can really realize this kind of one phased uh, construction or back-to-back -back phasing of one and two phases in order to do as little damage to our uh, educational activity within the natural sciences, okay? And with that, Dr. Poon, will you please uh, begin, and I, I'm assuming you have sharing capability. Uh, before you start, Dr. Poon, I just want to make one comment to all in the event that um, I have to jump off um, as my proxy, if you will, uh, Teresa Regnante will be taking over in the event um, anything is needed as far as uh, running the meeting. And if she's unavailable, then it will be Judge Hohauser. And, and thank you both. Hi, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, everyone can see the PowerPoint? Okay, uh, thank you for letting me speak today. I'm just gonna try to get through this quickly and talk to you about the natural sciences building innovation concerns. So I'll be presenting to you some quick facts regarding our growth. I might want to jump on this college council meeting. It's a Zoom. Oh, okay. It's okay. So I'm going to give you some quick facts regarding our growth in the sciences, followed by an overview of the state of the natural sciences building and our concerns over the proposed renovations. So I'm first going to present to you the drivers of revenue, growth, and student outcomes and identify the relationship between these three. So first, the primary driver of revenue at Old Westbury is through student tuition, and the sciences departments have contributed to this revenue through enrollment. Over the past 10 years, the sciences has steadily increased its enrollment of students that even in the face of a pandemic continues to increase. And this continues into the current fall semester in which we now serve over 700 biology, chemistry, and biochemistry majors. That's nearly 13% of the total undergraduate enrollment at Old Westbury. And meanwhile, to sustain our growth, we also have increased the number of faculty and adjuncts to better serve our growing population of students. Our science departments also serve a large percentage of underrepresented minorities. We are currently approaching 60%, and the faculty that serve the natural sciences building majors we have created a reputation for our science programs within the surrounding community. And that more importantly, aligns with President Sam's statement on creating a more competitive college 
not just for our general enrollment, but also for our, our URMs. Many of us are working diligently to continue this upward trend, which further contributes to the positive revenue at Westbury. All of this is interconnected, attracting students through success of our programs and dedicated faculty to implement these programs, it leads to increased revenue. We also have special federally funded programs such as CSTEP and LSAM that supports both URMs as well as disadvantaged students. When students join these programs, they are provided with both monetary as well as academic support, in addition to opportunities for paid mentored research with faculty. We have also historically aimed to close a wide graduation gap between URMs and non-URMs. Our college in comparison to other SUNYs and even other comprehensive colleges across the nation has a large percentage of underrepresented minority graduates. In the biological sciences alone, in the past five years, we have graduated about 45% underrepresented minority students. So we are undoubtedly doing a lot better than the national average in closing this gap. Which brings me to the faculty goals, which is to provide our students with pedagogy that has been shown to be successful. We use both CURES as well as applied learning practices. CURES stand for Course Embedded Undergraduate Research Experiences, and they are heavily, heavily driven by research, by faculty research. This is what has allowed us to close that graduation gap. Literature shows greater retention when CURES are used early on, so we have implemented CURES not only in our upper division courses, but the introductory courses as well. However, we do not have the modern infrastructure needed to support these hands-on research experiences. It takes a lot of resources to implement cures with many lab courses overflowing into faculty research lab spaces due to the lack of adequate, again, infrastructure. Which brings me to extramural funding, which is an avenue that faculty look, look to in supporting their research as well as cures. So this is a little table of the total amount of extramural funding from the past five years. And this coincides with the hiring of many new tenure track faculty who are working diligently to procure extramural funding, me included, um, particularly from federal funding sources, which pay out much higher indirect costs, some of which would effectively return into the college's revenue stream. While we have shown some success, this is just a small fraction of all of the applicants we have, applications we have submitted, and the critiques make it very clear that our infrastructure does not support student research. So while our grants, I don't like to focus on weaknesses, and while our grants have many strengths, such as our mission and our training of underrepresented minorities for the STEM workforce, it's ultimately these weaknesses that get our grants rejected. And here are just some examples of the critiques we have received. Um, most of the research faculty at SUNY Westbury have limited funding. Present research environment is weak, does not appear to be a culture of research. And here's um, some critiques from an independent grant. Track record exposing students to more sophisticated environments, not demonstrated, so it's lacking. It is unclear how this part of the project would benefit undergraduate students at our college. The bottom line is we cannot get training grants without getting independent grants, faculty independent research grants, and faculty cannot obtain independent research grants without proper facilities. This then feeds back into providing students with a proper education experience. So this brings me to the current state of the natural sciences building. This is just one example of a recurring issue that we encounter in the natural sciences building. When, while facilities have been working very diligently in trying to keep up with the repairs, the same issues keep recurring in addition to new ones. So the Natural Sciences Building is about 40 years old. It has been deteriorating rapidly in the past decade. There is not enough space to accommodate all of the majors that this building serves. The building serves students in biology, chemistry, biochemistry, bioinformatics, as well as public health majors in addition to faculty research in all of these areas, as well as biopsychology. We have surpassed the projected enrollment that was published in the 2016 capital planning documents by three years, and we're expected to continue to grow. 
And here's just a table of some of the issues with the NSV, including poor ventilation and temperature regulation that leads to the recurring mold problems. And when these issues occur, it disrupts teaching and it has also led to some minor and major injuries. While oftentimes faculty are resourceful and have taken their students down to their research lab spaces, this is also problematic because these spaces are generally shared with other faculty and their mentored research students. This then prevents faculty um, from having mentored research. And here are just some examples of the recurring mold problems that we have. This is the teaching lab ceiling that is frequently being replaced due to leaks. The ceiling was actually completely replaced prior to the start of the fall semester. And I keep knocking on wood that it's the last time it's going to be replaced. This is an example of the teaching um, tissue culture room, which has undergone two rounds of ceiling and floor tile repairs in the last year alone. I could go on, but I think you can imagine what it's like to be going to school with conditions such as these. So I'm gonna switch gears and show you this table, which is an estimate of the calculated student to space ratios across different SUNY campuses um, that had renovations and building additions to their science facilities. We have the smallest footprint per student in comparison to other campuses. I'm gonna to compare to Farmingdale because they're near us. Farming, Farmingdale in the past had served approximately 30% underrepresented minority students. And with the completion of their science building, they have increased their underrepresented minority student enrollment to 42%. If a student had to choose between our two campuses, which one do you think they would enroll in? To the best of our ability, the faculty are doing excellent work to provide STEM education to our students given our deteriorating building and lack of necessities. We are in dire need of a better building with more space and modern equipment. We were promised so much more and spent years in meetings creating what now turns out to be an impossible dream. This creates an unfair education experience for the students at Old Westbury in comparison to other SUNY campuses. So this now brings me into our renovation concerns. I'm just gonna give you a brief timeline. So this is a brief timeline of the Natural Science Building renovation planning, which began in early 2010. Sometime in 2014, the Capital Sur Space Survey was conducted and the survey was published in 2016 with several recommendations to address both the aging infrastructure and the growth of the sciences. In 2018, the concept planning began and we were told that there would be an addition and a renovation to the Natural Sciences Building. In 2019, we were essentially told we would only have a renovation, perhaps an addition in the future. In the fall, the semester of 2021, we were dropped a bombshell and the plans were completely changed. So this was, this, these were the potential costs for each renovation that were provided to us in an addition plan. Here in the purple, this, is, this was what we were first told we would be getting, a small addition plus a renovation. And then, um, then we were told we were only going to get a renovation only um, with the potential for the addition in the future and using modular trailers as surge space. We tried to stay optimistic. And then recently we learned that we will be provided with funding to start the renovation, which is phase one, without a guarantee of phase two to complete the construction. There was very little concern as to where to put all of the faculty and students during this first phase, and even less concern as to what happens while we wait, perhaps indefinitely, for the second phase to complete. Two ideas were put forth that demonstrate how little the sciences is valued at the college. The first is to renovate perhaps the E-wing at Campus Center for a temporary use, which will later be given to IT. The second is to rent trailers for laboratory coursework, which amounts close to what I was told originally, $17 million over four years. And after this period, there will be no more capital to further sustain our coursework and research, even if we manage to move to phase two. The vivarium would also be moved to a temporary space 
that will no longer be available during phase two. And we will be short one teaching lab after phase one. So we would still need temporary trailers or space, which won't be provided in the interim between phases. This is a Google picture of the potential proposed modular trailer that I found randomly um, because this is what I was told, we were told that we would be getting. And I want to emphasize that 32% of the budget will be spent on temporary space. This is not counting for inflation and these figures are not the latest projected amounts. This does not address our need for more permanent space to accommodate our very large student population. We are spending capital on temporary space and not on permanent space. All of this goes against our college's mission. This is detrimental to the science departments as well as the college. There won't be enough teaching or research lab spaces. Learning will be less optimal due to difficulty in implementing cure curriculum in trailers and temporary spaces. This overall will lead to poor optics on our campus as well as SUNY, causing discontinuity in student learning and retention. But most of all, we would be reversing our enrollment and growth in the sciences. So to give you an idea of the potential enrollment reversal, Buffalo State just underwent a 10 year renovation that was recently completed in January, 2021. They lost 15% of their enrollment this fall and they are projected to lose another 15%. If this happens to us, this will heavily impact our college, in particular, our revenue stream. It's also not just the sciences that will be affected, the entire campus will feel the impact of, this, of the current renovation plans. The School of Education has programs for students to specialize in the sciences whom we serve. And college-wide, the general ed requirements for graduation include a science course. So students would be affected across campus. The impact of faculty are also numerous. Faculty success, again, translates to student success, both in the classroom, through, implement through implementation of cures, and with independent research experiences. Even though faculty research is expected to continue, it's not feasible to carry out experiments due to intermittent vibrations. This would lead to discontinuity in faculty research, which would then negatively in impact mentored student research. And countless studies have shown that the success rate is much higher when students conduct mentored research. This then leads to disruption in research momentum more importantly, the loss of potential for extramural funding. This then further impacts opportunities for both professional and pedagogical advancement and ultimately leading to um, negative impact on both faculty recruitment and retention. Can I just ask a question? Who is imposing the timeline? So who is the who when you say they? Who's they in terms of whether it's a two year, three year, four year, 10 year renovation. SUCF. Who is it? SUCF, the SUNY Construction Fund. So the fund is in relationship to the timeline and the project controls the project development is or the or the or you know, just the um, sort of project phase of any capital expansion on any SUNY property? That is my understanding. I don't yes, know that's my understanding okay. as well, Teresa. That, okay. um, so, so keep in mind, SUNY receives X hundreds of millions of dollars annually mm -hmm. for construction, for capital construction. All capital improvements across the SUNY platform are managed and funded and the lead construction um, entity for the system is SUNY um, Construction Fund. So they're in charge of it, but they get a, a, a set allotment annually. And so they pick projects, <coughs> excuse me, and they use the funds that they receive annually to fund those projects. And so part of the challenge that we're highlighting here is that in one, the, the, the phase that we're referring to as one, 
is a phase that has the funding allotted from a fiscal year for the building, or excuse me, for the renovation. There's no guarantee, however, right? So what has happened, the amount of funding that the construction fund is giving for uh, the renovation is enough to do the, the upper level floors and not the lower level floors. And I, I think Kenny may get into that. Um, and the issue is by not doing that, you get into a real conundrum that Kenny was just about to raise around the vivarium. Um, so not enough funding is being provided in the one phase construction effort to allow for the full renovation to take place. I mean, I, I, I would understand that you know, to the doctor that's going through the presentation that, I mean, I think most of us get it. <laughs> this is a advocacy problem first and a public relations problem first. It is not necessarily a funding problem first. So I, I, I would say that in, in terms of, you know, you know your business the best and you know the implication of a project that starts at phase one that might only get to phase five and then you have five to 10 and then what? I think the question is how bold is the college to start something and apply the pressure on the SUNY system to finish? And what's the advocacy and the PR plan to do that? And how are the students that are in the program, the 700-ish students, being marshaled with their legislative districts of where they live to put pressure on the assembly and the Senate to make sure you have the money, as opposed to not starting something that you critically need to keep the college moving, my vote would be you start. You start, you go through, you apply the pressure and you have a plan to apply the pressure. And you take your lead assembly and senator in your districts and you take them through this from a place of they will be embarrassed not to get this done with you. So I don't think the SUNY system wants an embarrassment. So, you know, and I, I don't want to cut the pre, but I know I have to jump off in 10 minutes and I just wanted to, because I don't know how much longer the presentation is. And I did make a lot of notes in relationship to Cold Spring Harbor, to Brookhaven Labs, to other people that should be pushing in your corner because they need those students. And how is it that you're aligning with that public relations push to get two lab national presidents of national labs with you on this journey? Because without it, you're not gonna be successful in terms of the push at a Brookhaven lab and Cold Spring lab. And what are you doing in the Cold Spring lab space since you're physically close to them? Mm -hmm. to use some of their lab space? And can you? And what is the conversations you've had with Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories to, for them to understand your dilemma? So, I? I mean, I, I do have a lot of other notes and I do have to jump off because I have an executive conversation um, that I have to take for a budget, but um, oh, Teresa, I have to. Call so you I just anyway. wanted to. I'm just. I just wanted to share that. So I'm sorry to finish the presentation, but we could go offline, and I could help sort of Thank from you, my Jennifer. vantage point understand what might be a way um, forward differently than other than my council members might also. You know, obviously have a lot of suggestions, but Thank I would you. be bold and go forward. I would not be waiting if it was my business. Thank you very much, Teresa. I, I, I really appreciate those comments. I'm sure I'm sure everyone on this call does. I think Melissa Archibald, did you have something to say? 
Let yes, me, yes. Wait, wait. Millie, before Teresa leaves, I just wanted to add one, I think, important caveat, which I didn't want to do in terms of interrupting Dr. Poon. The chancellor and I have had a conversation about, he's in, 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 very interested and feeling very committed to addressing this. I just want you to know that, Teresa, before you, you got off. Okay, I'm sorry, Millie. No, 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 you don't have to apologize. I, I was gonna, going to say that, you know, as well, that you, you have definitely been advocating and it's something this campus has needed for quite some time. So I just wanted to let my fellow counsel, and this is not, Dr. Boone, this is not to interrupt the report. It's just we're having a, a discussion. You can certainly um, pick up as soon as uh, Melissa Archibald yeah. makes her, her yeah. comment or asks her question. Thank you. Um, I was um, pretty much, I have a long extending um, relationship with Brookhaven National Lab, mm. Priming Day State College. Actually, back in 2010 through 2013, I conducted and I run a STEM um, program in collaboration with two of those agencies and campuses. And even also, we call Spring Harvard. And I could personally tell you that when we were at Farmingdale um, doing all of these programs with them, our program pretty much put them on their map for them to have all those extensions of buildings that they have. They only needed uh, for um, program to showcase what they were doing with the population of students that we were serving in collaboration with those other agency like um, BNL and Cold Spring Harbor, and they even did a press release. And when you least expected, they got the funding. So I know for a fact also that Stony Brook also have been working in collaboration with BNL, and BNL has on um, rented offices and spaces within the colleges. So when they have to present any proposal, it was no brainer. So they kept giving them the funding for them to have expansion. So the question is, are you willing to collaborate with those agencies so you could put yourself in the map? So when you are advocating for this expansion that the funds are there, every time uh, when we were going to the um, meetings in Albany, we always came into that roadblock and they always said they have precedents on colleges is that already have programs in place and they needed to expand. So that was our disadvantage at all SUNY Westbury. Thank, thank you, Melissa. Um, Dr. Poonin, just to the other council members that are on, you're going to have an opportunity to comment and give recommendations and suggestions uh, as soon as the uh, PowerPoint presentation is over. Uh, go ahead, Dr. Poonin. Mike had his hand up though. Who did? Who did? Mike, Mike I can wait. The only the only point I wanted to make, and I know Teresa had to get off, is um, in its in its SUNY construction fund way, the project is underway. Um, not the way we want it to be, which is really what Dr. Poon's presentation is pointing out, nor need it to be. Um, so that that is it moving question is yes, it's moving haltingly and oddly the way state projects tend to do. Um, but uh, what Teresa, the, the, the question that Teresa asked that I'm most interested in having us delve into, and today is not today, is how bold are you willing to be? And with the chancellor already kind of offering an expression of commitment, we've got to be careful not to step over or around him um, because he does govern a lot of the things we need done. And which I'd like to piggyback off of that. It's not something, it's not a burden to shoulder alone, Dr. Sams, that that's where I, I, I feel, strongly feel, whoever the VP of Institutional Advancement is going to be, would certainly or should assist in a very, very grand way, putting that pressure on and getting a seat at that table and getting the voice heard on behalf of the campus. So, uh, and I will leave it at that. Dr. Poon, go, go ahead. Stop this. I use this uh, 
Um, I'm almost done. So I'm just gonna talk about what we want, which is we want the campus to prioritize, prioritize the renovation of the NSB. We have not only outgrown our building, the environment is no longer conducive to learning. This will impact our bottom line and competition for enrollment of all students in neighboring institutions. It would also co continue to impede our attempts to procure extramural funding. We want an extension in addition to the renovation to accommodate our overgrowth and to use the sur surge space during the renovation. All other solutions seems great, but we're spending capital on temporary spaces. It still does not solve our space needs, causes the most disruption in moving students, faculty, and equipment several times over the course of the renovation. With this addition, we also want a single phase renovation for the NSB, um, where the traditional lectures offices can be moved and the addition can then be used for lab courses and faculty research. And lastly, we prefer not to have trailers. It's just a poor investment of capital. Um, all of this would alleviate our concerns with enrollment, continuing to support the college's mission. Um, it'll make our college more our students more competitive in STEM fields. We'd like to appeal to SUNY, the governor, the old Westbury Foundation, whatever it takes. And I want to impress upon you why it's so important to make this renovation a priority and one that is done well, that results in the least disruption to both student um, learning and faculty research. This is just a quick quote um, from um, Dr. Quinn Capers from the US News article written back in 2019. She's the dean um, at o Ohio State Medical School. I'm going to try to say it quickly. It's possible to get accepted into med school without a research background, but the vast majority of med school applicants do have research experience. Um, that's just part of her quote, but for the most part, she's focusing on needing research experience. This is a table taken from the AAMC, a survey of um, matriculated medical students that had performed some amount of research starting as early as middle school. Nearly 60% of these matriculated medical students have had research experience as, under, as an undergraduate, with the average time spent conduct, conducting research to be about 1,251 hours. The expectation of having research experience is also similar for PhD programs across the country. And here's the quote direct from the AAMC. Most graduate schools will expect applicants to have practical experience. A strong application will most likely include participation in research throughout undergraduate years. Okay, and you're gonna find similar statements from various PhD programs. This is just some of our successes at Old Westbury. Um, within the past five years, we have sent nearly 50% of our applicants to health professional programs. And many of these students conducted independent mentor research. This is what gave them the leg up to get into these programs. So if, if we are conducting a renovation that is disruptive to both research and student learning, this is pretty much detrimental to our outcomes and our bottom line. And I leave you with our successes. These are pictures of some of our, of our graduates that have gone on to these successful programs. I'm just urging everyone to consider um, helping make this happen, um, of, uh, to conduct the renovation in a thoughtful way that does not negatively impact student and faculty success. Thank you. Dr. Poon, thank you so much that that was not only um, very informative, it was presented well. Um, I, I couldn't thank you enough. I have two quick comments to make, not, not recommendations wise, but two quick comments. I don't think that anyone would dispute the need, the desperate need to get this done and get this done right. Um, in a large way, the way that you presented, it should be done. So that that's that's not in dispute. It, it's, it's something that we all know is very necessary, that is needed. It's needed for the faculty, it's needed for the students, it's needed for the, the campus as a whole to continue on this upward trajectory. So I think we're all on the same page when it comes to the need. It's the how that presents the problem. Um, and the second quick comment I wanna make because I do want to open up the floor to, to fellow council members, is we are not a trailer park. <laughs> it, this is a beautiful campus. You, the minute I, I, I heard that as a even a possible idea, I think I had like a physical reaction to it. So 
it come hell or high water, that's off the table, in my opinion. But um, other than those two comments, uh, does any do any other council members have any comments, recommendations, suggestions? Unfortunately, we don't have a lot on. Bill, Bill, you're muted. Are were you trying to talk? Judge Hohauser, no, you're not trying to speak. Okay. No, no, I'm fine. No, I'm fine. I'm, I was, uh, one of my colleagues came into my chambers for a moment. Okay. Um, Martha. Yes. Uh, first, I want to thank you, Dr. Pong, for this presentation. I, this is very close to me because I actually have a 16 year old son that now is looking for college. He's interested in science. And from my experience as a mom, it's like, they are, they have a different vision now that what they are looking into at college. And I, you know, he's doing his own research. He's going to different, uh, and I will like, I am scheduled also to go to also New Westbury. And I think that uh, we, all that you are presenting is like um, how we are in the game, right? How we became more competitive. And, and I think that, you did an amazing presentation, provide us the information to see which is the problem, but also the vision, the way we would like to move forward. And I don't know if it's possible to really um, to create like a committee, like uh, uh, that we can, they can work together. And I think if Dr. Pong already provide, you know, a lot of details of how to move forward and maybe like a working committee that we can help to see how we can make it that happen in 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 you know in more realistic way this is my suggestion thank you martha M melissa um i believe you already gave your comments earlier do you have any additional um well yes the only thing is um i have helped so many other um agency with the uh, research experience at both um, BNL and Cold Spring Harvard. And I was wondering if our campuses have collaborated with them in various projects, because if you don't have that type of um, collaboration, it's gonna kind of be a little bit difficult to, to try to pull a lot of revenue just for those type of um, projects. And um, the one of the local state senates in that region uh, is very good friend of mine. And she also um, does listen whenever there is something involved with a large um, population, just like what the presentation was given underrepresented students that are benefiting from, from these projects. So um, I will reach out to her to see how can she um, also have an ear to, to your project. And I just want to follow up on that because it is my passion to empower people in the area of STEM. And of course, you need to have a lab um, that is adequate and the facility to accommodate all of those projects. And it is possible just you got to bring everyone together in order for this funding to really continue to, to provide the, you know, the resources for the building to, to be completed. So that's my final. Thank, thank you. Um, the reason why I don't have much by way of substantive recommendation is because Teresa basically in different words said exactly what um, I, I would have said and I would have recommended. And I know she's got more to say. I think those discussions can, can happen offline, but it's recognizing the import of the moving parts and understanding that it's not just making an ask to SUNY, it's, it's this interplay of understanding, you know, the, the political angle, understanding, you know, PR angle, understanding, you know, what, what whether it's what what private companies want or public, it, it's 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 a mixture, and the pressure has to be has to be put on, depending on like the 
Teresa mentioned some public, some private. So it's a mixture of private philanthropy, politics. Um, and that's really where that, uh, that, that pressure needs to be placed. You would need someone in charge of what the plan is so that there's a plan to be presented when whoever is sitting down with these folks to put the pressure on, right? Everyone has to be in unison about what that, what that plan is and what the goal is. So someone has to create that plan and then uh, attack. Does anyone else have any, I, I could keep going on and on and on, but you know. I know that Duncan had something. Oh, please, Dr. Warless. So yes, thank you. I, I just wanted to point out that we do have faculty members that collaborate uh, or, and or are using facility both at Cold Spring Harbor and BNL. Um, we do have longstanding relationships, uh, particularly with BNL, uh, around STEM education in particular. Uh, so I, I'm certainly willing to follow up uh, with uh, Ms. Archibald if she's willing to sort of have some additional conversations that uh, can help us with some of the strategy for advocacy. Yes, you know, the, you, you. yes, I will do, you know, anything that within my power and whatever it is that I could take to make it happen, just let us do it. Thank you. Um, and I do think that it would be a good idea to create some sort of a committee that has both campus folks and off-campus folks uh, on it to, you know, to spearhead th this effort. Other than that, I, I, you know, most of my other comments and uh, recommendations can be had offline uh, with Dr. Sams and and people from the cabinet. Uh, does anyone else have any other uh, comments to make before I move on? You have Ed, Ed Bever. Oh, Ed, go ahead. I'm sorry, I don't have everybody on my screen. Hi, uh, I just want to say I've been at the college for 25 years almost. And while I've been rather distance, I was a history professor, now I'm in professional studies. That distance gives me kind of a, a long distance overview. And something that hit me soon after I got to the college, a phrase popped into my, my brain, which was that Old Westbury is the bottom of the pork barrel. That is when they start doling out resources to Old Westbury, it's because they've gone through all the other possibilities. And it's because I think, um, we're kind of an orphan. The upstate campuses, Stony Brook, Farmingdale, all have enthusiastic constituencies politically that support them. Oneonta, Oswego, I don't know the details of it, but my impression is those are the apple of the eye of their state legislatures and legislators and their state senators. Those are important employers. They're important community centers and cultural centers. They're showpieces for that district. Old Westbury was rejected in many ways by Nassau County from the very beginning. We weren't doing what they wanted us to do. And that tradition of distance, Nassau Community College when I got here was very reluctant to collaborate with us was my understanding. And um, that's the position that we're starting from. And I just wanted to put that out there um, because I think, I think I, I, I'm happy to hear all the positive suggestions and I hope that we can take advantage of them. I think they're gonna be very good. I also thought Teresa made the excellent point that this is a political and PR issue and that's our strongest leverage, that it's an embarrassment for the SUNY system. It's an embarrassment for the state of New York. Um, I just wanna point briefly, there was an article in Inside Higher Education yesterday that a group of, of SUNY and CUNY faculty put together a, a study of the ratio of adjuncts to students it, across the two systems. And they showed that there is a very clear relationship between the, the racial composition of the and ethnic composition of the student bodies and the ratio of full-time faculty 
to, um, to, to students that came out yesterday. It's been circulated by our faculty. But in any case, I just think, you know, I wanna just underscore what Teresa said. I think that's the strongest card and that's what we need to push on, is that this is an issue of equity and accessibility and promoting goals that everybody agrees with. But when it gets down to the nitty gritty of allocating resources, somehow those ideals get squeezed out by practical, um, you know, expedient realities. Anyway, I'll shut up now. And, no, th thank you, Ed. I, I actually could not agree with that more. Um, I think that Dr. Sams has been doing so far in the short period of time he's been here, a very good job at advocating. And I think um, the result that we are seeing today as far as, you know, using your words, Ed, being at the bottom of the barrel when funds are being allocated is a result of um, lack of strong advocacy over, uh, uh, you know, several consecutive years. And when you don't have any sort of a leader that is strongly advocating on behalf of the campus and there's 64 of them and everybody wants a piece of that pie, you know, that, that, that's the result. So there's one way to, one place to go from here, which is up, um, because when you look at those numbers and the slide that moved me the most was Dr. Poon's slide that shows, you know, the square, put it, the, the square footage per student and our enrollment compared to uh, other campuses enrollment and what their square footage is. And then the monies, the comparison of the monies being doled out to each of the campuses, it just doesn't, it doesn't add up. It actually should be the opposite right? Because we have the highest enrollment, enrollment is going up. We sh the, the most money from that pot should be coming to this campus because of how low the square footage is uh, per student. And it's something that we should all be angry about. And that's what, that's what makes that fight um, a passionate fight. And, and, you know, when you fight with passion and you put pressure on folks with passion, it, It'll work. It'll work. It's it's not a one and done uh, fight. It's not a one and done type of. It's you know, patient persistence. But you you need to be definitely persistent until you get that yes. Until you until we get what we need uh, for our students and our faculty. Um, are there any other comments that anyone wants to make on this particular issue? Okay, the only other um, item I have left on the agenda is the open meeting portion. Um, at the next meeting, I will be taking, I will be asking um, Dr. Dean Royce to give an update, uh, the faculty senate chair. I will ask uh, Lionel Chitty to please be present to give um, uh, the alumni update and um, Olu, Olu had to jump off, but she will be giving the SGA uh, update um, as well at the next meeting, which will be sometime in March. I just haven't selected uh, a date yet. Danae, I know I owe you a date. Um, so moving on to the open meeting section of the, of the meeting, are there any comments or questions from the public? Mike, is there anyone around that's not on this call? Oh, you're on mute. Yeah, I was just looking at the participants list. I mean, oh. yeah, there are people here who are not regularly here, but if, if they're just here to observe, that's fine. All right. All right. Hearing no comments from the public, can I have a motion to adjourn? Any council member want to move to adjourn? I'll move. Motion. Okay. Bill and uh, Melissa second, and the meeting is adjourned. You will get a date in the near future. I hope everyone has uh, a wonderful holiday, a, a great new year. And uh, Danae, if we can please put uh, in our next set of minutes, um, an action item section with 
some of the things that were said here that that should be an action item in the minutes as a separate section, I think that would be great and that'll keep us on track so we can continue to follow up. All right, thank you. It's good to see you all. Mm -hmm.